Hi everyone, and welcome to today's event. I'm your host, Taylor Hudak. I'm an independent journalist, activist, and the marketing team lead for Panquake. So what is Panquake? Well, we are redefining social media, transparently delivering powerful next generation amplification tools to transform your social reach and engagement. Tonight, you are going to hear so much more about this groundbreaking product. And you will also be hearing from Panquake co-founder, Susie Dawson. We also have a fantastic lineup of guests, including Yale Privacy Lab founder, Sean O'Brien, investigative journalist, Chris Hedges, Bill Binney, comedians, Graham Elwood, Jimmy Dore, and Lee Camp, as well as Garland Nixon and Peter LaBelle. And then we also do have a special message from Christine Assange, the mother of Julian Assange. But first up, I do want to hand this over to journalist and activist Susie Dawson. Thank you so much, Taylor. And I'm so pleased to be at this event. This project has been four months in the making and has involved some of the coolest people that I know. We've had over 20 staff working on a daily basis to bring to you what you're about to see tonight which really is next generation technology and social media space. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my journey and how I came to believing that a product like what you're about to see needed to exist. And I thought we'd just start off with some statistics. I'm sure I don't have to name my platform of choice for social media. You'll be very aware what that is. And you probably know that that platform made some official announcements last September about major changes to the core functionality of their program and the way that they deliver content. And I wanted to start by showing you some of my analytics from that program so that you can see what's been happening to my social media account over the last few months. Here are the analytics from my personal social media account. You'll see in August, I earned 5.13 million impressions. But more importantly, I had 3,300 mentions, people interacting with me on my account and having discussions with me. By September, immediately following the announcement about changes to core functionality, my reach had dropped to 2.7 million from 5.1 million. Yet I had more people having conversations with me than in the previous month. The following month, my reach dropped by another 1 million, meaning I was now down about 65% on my original reach, and yet I still had approximately the same amount of people engaging with my content and having conversations directly with me. It was around the September, October period that I decided that this was, situation was intolerable to me personally. And so I actually stopped posting on social media, and you'll see my, posts went from 600 odd to less than 100 and the reason for that was because I'd started to work on this project full time. I wanted to find a solution for everybody and I wanted to put an end to this interference and the censorship. And so thinking about big tech, I know it's a huge topic in the news at the moment. I know everybody is talking about it and everybody is screaming for a solution. And I've been putting a lot of thought into what is the nature of our relationship with the platforms that we engage in on a daily basis. And the conclusion I've come to is that we have been in an abusive relationship with big tech. Like all abusers, they lie to us. They gaslight us. They're meddling in our relationships. They use our reputation to hold us hostage. They exert discipline as if we are small children. They apply their punishments arbitrarily and disproportionately. And then they blame us for it as if it's our fault. And like all abusers, they like to keep that abuse secret. Ending the abuse of us by the big tech platforms or even enjoying a temporary absence of that abuse is only the beginning of the solution to any abusive relationship. The healing doesn't really begin and we don't truly begin to enjoy life and realize our full potential until we are able to engage in a relationship that is the opposite. One that is trusting and loving and genuine and supportive and kind and understanding. A relationship 
that builds confidence. When I began the process of delivering this product, it was because I was outraged at what big tech was doing to me. It's one thing to take personal risks to be able to share vitally important information. That I could live with, but it's another thing entirely to take personal risks and then not be able to share that information. That is intolerable. Watching precisely that dynamic play out and worsen day by day, month by month, I became determined to create a solution. So I began to speak to other content creators about what big tech was doing to them. I discovered the suppression and manipulation was occurring across the board. And that made me even more outraged and even more determined to create a new platform for us all. A defining moment for me was when I began to talk to social media users who utilize different tech products than I do. These were people with little to no technical ability or IT experience from a different generation than me and differing geographical and demographic profiles and who have zero chance at creating new solutions for themselves. Yet they told me story after story about the way that the conduct of big tech was negatively impacting them in their IRL lives. This isn't just about the online world. One woman told me about how she had followed a real life friend of hers on a very large platform with 2 billion users that should remain nameless and had initially engaged with her friend's content only to stop seeing that content appearing on her timeline anymore. Because she didn't see it anymore, she stopped engaging with it. When she then saw her friend in person, her friend was frosty and hostile and standoffish with her, and she had no idea why. And then she realized her real life relationship was being damaged by interference from the tech monopolies. The things that the woman told me was so profound that I started taking notes. I actually recorded it word for word. And I'm going to share with you what she said. She told me, users don't know what we're seeing, why, how, or who is controlling it. Well, as an activist and a journalist, investigating intelligence agencies and governments, I know who's controlling it, but regular users don't. And they don't necessarily even care who is controlling it. They just know that something bad is going on and that they feel really confused by it and upset. She said to me, they're not just changing what we consume, they're changing our relationships. She felt a real loss of control, an inability to control and influence her own relationships in her own life because there's this behemoth force that is intervening and, and impacting those relationships. She told me people's content isn't just disappearing, it's being replaced with something else. And just as she had talked about the impact on her of her friend being frosty and hostile to her because they had been forcefully separated by social media, this is exactly it. Her friend wasn't just disappearing from her feed or from her timeline. Her friend was being replaced with something else. She said, we're being fed content instead of choosing to access it. She felt infantilized and manipulated. And she said, and this one really hit home with me. She said, we're trying to create and maintain relationships with people we know and trust and someone else is meddling with that relationship. So I got in the back of my mind a niggling little thought that Julian Assange had been talking about this for a very long time. And I went back and looked through his historical tweets and I found over 30 tweets from Julian across 2016 and 2017, talking about exactly these problems and warning that they were going to get worse. Julian as ever was ahead of the times and he talked about the filterverse of one. He said, Twitter's increasing censorship points to the future. Each person will live in an undetectable filterverse of one. And that is exactly what has been happening to all of us. 
the big tech companies control the filter verse. You are in an invisible prison. And when you are trying to send information out to your friends and followers, or they are trying to send information to you, that is being interfered with by the big tech companies. All info in or out is manipulated by them. And then I stumbled across this tweet. It was Julian Assange calling for the creation of an alternative. And he said, I am looking for a decentralized, a cryptographic alternative to Twitter. Twitter's freedom of expression has been on an inexorable decline. It is enslaved to its US jurisdiction and politics. Although it is substantially better than Facebook, that is a very low standard indeed. Now, something that I don't think many of you would know about me, you know that I'm a journalist, you know that I'm an activist. Some of you know I stood in the general election in New Zealand in 2017. Um, but what not so many people know about me is that I'm also actually a software development manager. Uh, in my last day job in New Zealand, I mean, I've been in, I was in tech for 20 years, but in my last day job in New Zealand, I was leading a whole team of developers um, developing web to print products for major New Zealand universities, web portals and web services, designing them, working with developers to build them and then going to customer sites and delivering them. And so I decided that maybe rather than just through journalism and activism, there was another way for me to serve the public. And I realized that creating an alternative that people can truly trust in, that solves the problems of the social dilemma and recruiting the most talented and qualified people that I know all around the world to do that with me, could serve the activist community and the independent media community far beyond what I have been doing just through my own articles or my own YouTube shows or whatever else I've been engaged in. And so I started to put a lot of time and effort into designing an alternative. And ultimately, what I came up with was Panquake. Pan means all, all of us. And Quake is the huge impact and huge effect that we can all have when we are not being suppressed and when we are not being censored. And so that means that we right now have a unique opportunity together to break the filter verse, that filter verse of one that Julian talked about. We can smash that to pieces with Panquake. Panquake is going to free your ability to communicate with your friends and followers and their ability to communicate with you without any middleman, without any interference, without any manipulation. And in doing so, yes, you will get exponentially more reach, you will get exponentially more interaction, exponentially more amplification, but more importantly, it will stop your real life, real world relationships being interfered with and it will put you back in control of your social life whether that's online or offline. So Panquake is fundamentally a short messaging service that helps you to curate, collate and communicate messages quickly and easily. We have built our own custom blockchain to save all of the public data that you choose to publish on our platform and to preserve records of the interactions that you have so that never again do you have to wonder whether the things you have done are being interfered with or manipulated. Panquake is about more though than just solving the problems of conventional tech. Panquake is chock full of groundbreaking next generation messaging solutions tools that give you the ability to do things that you could not even dream of yet. And Panquake, because we don't want to serve corporations or governments, we don't want to serve advertisers, we want to serve you, we want to serve users, we want to serve people we care about, our friends, our family, our communities across the globe. Panquake is a user-supported network. We are not looking for venture capital, we are not looking for commercial investment, we are not looking for page ranking services to reflect us favorably so that we can attract Wall Street bigwigs. 
we are simply a user supported network serving our users. In doing so, we are going to redefine social media. Panquake is comprised of 14 ironclad solutions to major social media problems. It has four brand new powerful features, functionality that does not exist on any other social media platform in the world. You will be able to have trust and integrity in our platform via the transparency of the blockchain. You will have total ownership and control of your own data, a solid balance of privacy and transparency, and the ability to earn cryptocurrency for your content. I will be talking a lot more in the future about our commercialization and monetization model, and you will receive a lot more info about this. But for tonight, I'm just going to take you through some of the top level design features of, and particulars of Panquake. So in terms of the 14 solutions, some of you will remember a few months ago, I was having uh, conversations on my uh, not to be mentioned name of most favored social media platform with people to find out what is it that's driving them nuts? What do they want fixed so that I could work out how to solve those problems? And this is the feedback I got. I heard that people are sick of their page arbitrarily refreshing when they're trying to look at content, which forces them to lose the content they're looking at and to then be served with the content that the platform would instead prefer that they see. I heard that people are sick of being shadow banned and feeling like they're being forcibly made invisible. They're not seen or heard. They're sick of trends being manipulated. They're sick of arbitrary account suspensions, finding out one day, like I did actually just a few days ago, all of a sudden locked out of my account, had to call all my friends and say, hey, tell the world that I'm locked out of my account, please, so that I can get back in. Luckily for me, I had friends with big enough platforms that they were able to apply some pressure and free me and get me access to my account back. But many people around the world never regain access to their accounts. People are sick of non-linear timelines with content that's scrambled all out of order. They're sick of RTing and liking content only to discover they haven't RTed or liked that content according to the platform that should remain nameless. I can tell you that one of my best friends, Kim.com, has a pinned tweet that I have been retweeting and liking for five years. And no matter how many times I retweet and like it, my retweet and like is never, ever counted on that communication. People are sick of advertising. I get Chanel ads. Other people get ads that are far more embarrassing. I can tell you I've never bought anything from Chanel in my entire life. Yet there they are on my timeline on a daily basis. People are sick of their personal information being sold to corporations and, or worse, governments and security agencies. People are sick of being prostituted out for the privilege of having use of a platform that does all of these terrible things to them. They're sick of their personalization algorithms inferring what their interests are and tracking them through every browser tab they open, watching everything they read, seeing everything they log into. They're sick of the blue tick bias, which is increasingly becoming a problem, where the platforms decide who they will consider verified and who they won't. I stood for the Prime Ministership of New Zealand, leading a registered political party, and I still wasn't able to get verified. Julian Assange wasn't able to get verified, and yet a fake Julian Assange account had a verification tick. So we need a system that allows us to self-verify rather than verification being some privilege granted to us by a platform that may or may not like what we are doing. People are sick of suggested follows. I get told to follow the NSA, the CIA, and the FBI. Literally, their official accounts put on my social media page and me being told to follow them. Of Cross-platform links being discriminated against, of top tweets not actually being the top tweets, but just some tweet that got 20 retweets by a blue tick when there are tweets with thousands of retweets that would never make it onto the top tweet page. And disappearing follows, finding that people they care about have been unfollowed from them and the people who care about them being unfollowed as well. So coming to the brand new functionality, these are the, the solutions that I designed that really, for me, I was thinking, what could social media platforms give us that they don't? Like, what have they been restricting from us all of this time? 
And that was when I started to think about curation. I'm constantly sending people like Caitlin Johnston and Jimmy Dore links to my tweets because I'm scared they won't see them otherwise. And sometimes I wonder, are they getting constant push notifications from me? Are they feeling harassed by me? And so I thought, how about we design a piece of functionality that will allow us to stack messages from different people and from ourselves on certain topics into a single link so that I can go, okay, I love this tweet by Jimmy, this tweet by Caitlin. Here's a couple of my tweets that are relevant. Here's some things I found on a hashtag. Click, 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 just to select them as simple as clicking the messages, hit one button, get a link, send it to Caitlin, send it to Jimmy and have them able to see in a single page view these uh, messages that I've curated for them that I believe will be interesting to them. From a functionality, from a design and development perspective, it's a very simple thing to do. And yet for some reason, we've never been able to do it. So this is for us what a pan quake is. A pan quake is where you take quakes, which are our versions of tweets, that you like and care about and you believe your friends and family will like and care about and you stack them into a single link that you can share on platform or off platform at any time. Thunderquakes. We don't want thunderquakes just to be something that we earn for ourselves. We want it to be something that we give to other people. We want to earn things and gift them to the people that we love. So on Panquake, you earn thunderquake points you can gift those Thunderquake points to accounts who you want to help to be able to more effectively spread their message to a wider audience. Then when that Thunderquake message is scheduled, it copies to all of the uh, notification tabs of all the followers of that account. Those followers can then decide to either commit to participating in the Thunderquake or not. And it, then when the Thunderquake is ready to go off, then all of the people who have opted in to supporting that message will automatically have the Thunderquake copy to their timeline, regardless of whether they're online or offline. And in the spirit of wanting to circulate more feel-good feelings, so to, to get better relations, foster better relationships between people and Panquake, we invented Cupquakes. Cupquakes are something that every user gets once per day. And they are encouraged to find the accounts that they think are sharing the most important, significant messages and to, in one click, gift them a cupquake. Doing so will then post a special message promoting that account onto your user timeline and notify the person who you've chosen to promote that you have expended your daily cupquake on them. So who knows, maybe they'll then expend their daily cupquake on you. And love quakes are possibly the most powerful new functionality that we've come up with. I know from other people, that, other content creators that I work with, that they spend hours per day just manually retweeting, manually sharing content from timelines that they follow and care about. Well, from now on with Panquake, you can love quake an account that you trust and 100% of that content will share to your timeline automatically without you manually having to click or browse anything. And that will happen again, whether you're online or offline. So what Panquick does is allow you to be an active social media user and participant, even if you are not at your device. And it will save hours of time per day for active social media users. So in terms of Panquick design, there are some pretty basic principles from a design perspective about how we have built this program. And that is that we want every single aspect of the design to be about making things better for the user, not better for advertisers, not better for us as a company, better for the users and the user experience. So one of the things that always frustrated me about my platform of choice is I constantly have to have a million tabs open because I can't stand the having to navigate forward and back all the time. There's constant extra page views and extra clicks and all of the workflows that are really time consuming to navigate. And I found out why that is. Apparently, it's because the more page views and the more clicks, the more engagement and the higher the platform is reported to be in the page ranking services 
which are then used to secure commercial investment into the company. So us not needing to have commercial investment means that we don't need to stick extra page views and page clicks or page loads in your workflows. You can have dramatically less clicks. You can see everything on one screen. You don't have to have multiple tabs open and we can serve you your content in a fraction of the time that the big tech platforms do because we don't need to falsely inflate the amount of time that you use our platform so that we can impress investors. So we've got really, really light workflows and a bigger accessibility focus. Um, but even more like special, in my opinion, is that we've built the user interface to be totally drag and drop. So where you see your user profiles and where you see your timeline and where you see site statistics and cool functions, where you see your Thunderquake meter, where you see your message box to write your messages, you can drag them around to any position on the screen that you prefer. You can customize the entire workspace. And all of those things sit in a single view dashboard that's updated by dynamic content, which means if I go and look at a quake by Caitlin Johnston, her profile details show up in the profile box. If I go back and look at my own timeline, my profile details show up in the profile box without having to browse to a separate page, without having to rescreen or wait for loading times. All of the content on Panquake is dynamic, which makes it fast. So having an amazing product and great functionality is obviously really important, but more important to me from an integrity perspective is who we are as a company. Who, who is it that's behind Panquake and what are, what are our ethics? The core problem, as far as I can tell, is that the user has been made the product and the corporations have become the customer of social media companies. Well, we have to change that. We have to make the user the customer and then serve our users. So in our architecture, we designed it, our platform, so that we cannot sell your data to anybody. Why? Because we don't collect your data. We don't have centralized servers. We don't retain any information about our users, not email addresses, not mobile phone numbers, nothing. By constitution, we're committing that we will not sell our company. We are not flipping pancakes. And architecturally, we really can't sell anyway because we don't have anything to give a customer or, or to give a, a, a purchaser if they want to buy our company. Why? because our network exists only on the devices of our users. So you collectively are Panquake. Of course, this means that as a user supported network, we, because we're not taking money from governments or corporations, will have a small, modest, flat fee for all users in order to access our full functionality set. But that is why that is what enables us to build our entire product and to model our entire company to be in your benefit, to save you time and to give you power and social reach and amplification tools that no other platform can. Um, I won't go through all of the various elements of the program tonight. Obviously, it's been four months in development already and is at a fairly a relatively advanced stage in terms of documentation, all of our architecture and design uh, planning and document documentation is done. As you'll see later, our systems are already um, configured. We have people working on the build as we speak. Um, so there will be a constant stream of new information coming out to you about Panquake in the coming weeks. So I won't get too much further into it tonight other than to say we will be holding a second stream next week, Saturday, 23rd of January. And given the technical issues we had trying to get our first stream out to you um, tonight, we will likely pre-record and then release that stream. But that stream will be a full-blown tech stream. We will be talking software licensing. We will be talking architectural models. We'll be talking blockchain processes, consensus algorithms. We will be giving you the confidence that we know exactly what we're doing from a technical perspective around how to build and implement and successfully roll out and deliver this product. Thereafter, I intend to, just as I would in my commercial life, 
uh, show up at client site, which for us here is me in video form, delivering to you all every single month the updates about the build progress of Panquake. So that leads me to next steps. What are the next steps? The next steps are when this stream is uploaded and by the time you are viewing it, you will see a whole suite of public Panquake social media account information to you about this platform you can and should right now visit panquake.com when you get to panquake.com this is what you will see there are three easy steps for joining the panquake.com community and i will just share screen and show you right now Panquake is asking three simple things of you. One, that you donate now to express your interest in Panquake. And when you click that link, you will go to our Go Get Funding page. We would love it if you would leave a nice supportive comment for us in the comments section. There is a little bit more information here about precisely where we're at with our build progress and who the public endorsers are that have thrown their full weight behind supporting this pr product and who will be advocating for us in the public space. I've also got a little bit of information here for you about all of the different people who are currently working to make Panquake a reality. These are the roles that have been filled and these people have been absolutely working their butts off to bring this solution to us all. Once you've donated, there will be a link in the thank you screen at the end of the donation process which will provide you with a 12 word passphrase. That passphrase you should screenshot or copy or write down on a piece of paper if you're super clever about this stuff, that actually is the most secure way to do it. That 12 word passphrase is going to get you early access to our platform once we have delivered our beta solution. And then step three, of course, is to tell everybody you know, your friends and family about Panquake. Tell them that something different is coming to the space. Tell them that finally users are going to be the customers, that users are going to own their own data, that users are going to have the ability to spread their content far and wide in ways they've never been able to do before. If you help us to spread the word, if you donate to help us complete the build, we truly are going to redefine social media. We're going to change this industry from, from an industry that is predatory in its practices and that violates your rights on a daily basis under the guise of you being willing to use their platform, you're going to instead have a space that you can trust, that you can prove that no manipulation is occurring, and where you can build a following that you know can't be taken from you by malicious forces. And in doing that, we will free ourselves from the filterverse of one. We will break the isolation. We will be seen. We will be heard. And we will realize Julian's dream of a decentralized and cryptographic alternative to the existing big tech filterverse. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand back to Taylor Hudak for now. And I hope you have a great time seeing all the amazing guests that we have for you tonight. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Susie, thank you for that explanation. I'm sure the viewers right now are excited, intrigued, and wanting to hear more. So I think now would be a great opportunity to bring on a core member of the Panquake team. He is also the founder of Yale Privacy Lab at Yale University. So Sean O'Brien is joining us now. Sean, welcome to the stream. Great, excited to be here. And I really would like to just talk about some of the issues that Susie just touched on. Um, she did a great job sort of outlining what makes Panquake different. Um, and I think that's really what we should try to focus on, right? We all have uh, our, of course, justifiable gripes with social media, um, with the big te tech uh, corporations that run our lives, right? Um, and this is a systematic problem that we do need to get away from. But what's really cool is we have the opportunity here, right, to liberate ourselves and take some proactive control, not be so reactive. Um, you know, often so at, at Yale Privacy Lab and then also at Digital Security Lab at ExpressVPN, um, we're always looking at um, 
issues with privacy. We're looking at security issues. We're looking at malware. Um, we're talking about the polluted ecosystem of software that's out there, right? Um, and I think a lot of folks are now very much aware of uh, how polluted social media is, but also how controlled social media is, right? Um, and being able to sort of take a um, serious uh, control back into your life um, and use these amazing new features, right? Um, the thunderquake, the cupquake, the lovequake, right? Um, those features are not only features that are um, innovative, they're features which uh, allow you as an activist, as an organizer, as a content creator, um, to amplify your voice, um, to be able to build and grow community, right? Um, these tools are things that um, by design don't belong <laughs> in the big tech version of social media. Um, the freemium model is surveillance, you know, 99% of the time, especially when we're talking about the big tech world. Um, the team behind Panquake is not going to ship anything that has um, manipulative features. Um, there's going to be no recommendations in your feed of people you should follow, right? Um, your uh, social conversation, your social stream is going to be more opt-in. Um, you're going to have the capability to, of course, find people, to find people who are interested in the things you're interested in, but you're not going to be a rat in a maze. Um, the manipulation that goes on, uh, which of course fills the coffers of the Facebooks and the Twitters, I'm going to name them, <laughs> of those big tech social networks, um, the, both the data coffers, right, and the actual, you know, the financials, um, which are based upon that data pilfering, um, you know, that kind of manipulation uh, does not need to occur. And once you remove all that, once you step outside of the walled garden, um, then suddenly you can think about these new uh, features. You can think about other ways that, you know, people might be able to come together and have a conversation, which don't require you going through a dedicated path that can be easily studied by some data broker. Um, so yeah, so that's the, the first thing I really wanted to touch on. Um, you know, I, most of the work that I do is around privacy and so on. Um, and I was brought on to be an advisor on that aspect. And uh, there will be a very strong dedication to privacy in this project. Um, and that's something I'll definitely be um, making sure we follow forward with. Um, but the manipulation, the social dilemma, um, those kinds of issues, I think, um, are very core to what we've seen go on um, in the last few years, certainly in the last year, in the last couple of weeks. Um, it's the reason that people are jumping ship right now from WhatsApp uh, in droves and they're going to signal. Um, and some of them are going to, uh, well, a lot of them are going to Telegram as well. Um, people are uh, hungry for new uh, replacements for the tired old tech that's based on these data surveillance models. Um, so Panquake fits very well into that milieu, to use a fancy word. Um, it fits very well into the world that we're moving into. Um, and that's sort of a building attitude rather than just, you know, um, having to feel uh, like you're repairing all the time uh, is it, something that I think is really important about the project. Um, Historically, right, um, the type of um, censorship, the type of manipulation that we're talking about here um, is as old as the written word or older, right? Um, I always say, you know, book burning is about as old as the printing press, right? Um, people have been burning books for as long as it's been easy for people to get their hands on the printed word. Uh, and the technology that we have here um, is very similar. In the late 20th century, and uh, certainly I and, and others who were on the internet in that time period, um, there was sort of a promise of freeing information um, that was going on. We had a feeling that um, access to knowledge and collaborative um, you know, um, pooling of knowledge and, and dissemination was going to change the world. And it did, uh, but there was a very swift 
reaction to that that coincided with it, that was parallel to it, and which now we're really, really seeing amplified. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has made this easier, of course. Um, I always say that, you know, um, these types of global events are um, opportunities for people in power who are looking for more control to get it. Um, and uh, so the things we see with the, um, with the social dilemma, the things we see with the social networks uh, and, and the fervor around um, any alternative network that dares try to unseat, you know, the big tech ones, um, you know, that, that's something that um, we need to break free from. So, um, you know, uh, this product is the actual fulfillment of the kinds of promises um, that the Facebook folks, Zuckerberg, et cetera, um, that Twitter's, you know, Jack Dorsey. Um, these are, this project can be the kind of project that actually fulfills the supposed promises that someone like Dorsey is, is making. Um, just the other day, um, Jack got on uh, Twitter again and, you know, lamented about the censorship on the platform and said, you know, don't worry about it. We have a team that's on it. Uh, we're working on it, you know, as fast as we can. And uh, that team's been working now for over a year uh, and hasn't produced anything that's actionable or of any real merit. And we're talking about a company that, of course, is giant, has access to all kinds of infrastructure, has ac access to the annals of power, right? Um, and still, this thing has not materialized. So we need real grassroots solutions. Uh, we need folks who are willing to be courageous, um, who are able to um, not only uh, implement this stuff, but to actually, you know, have that courage to push the um, goalpost further and then to leap over it, right? Um, the people who are really, really looking to change the world that we're in. Um, so we definitely need that. Um, utopian technology, you know, uh, the type of technology that uh, we're talking about here, it's been talked about before, right? Um, folks come along, you know, every few years, every few months even, and um, have projects that they say are going to change this terrible problem that we have with social media. Um, I've been involved in uh, uh, the Fediverse, uh, so-called Federated Social Networks um, for the better part of a decade now. Um, I've implemented some of these solutions on my own and ran little social networks and so on. Um, I can tell you that what's going on here uh, with Panquake is very different. Um, and that's more about the willingness to not just reinvent uh, the features that are in these other networks, but to try to think of ways that once you get out of that paradigm, right, um, you can really um, change the interaction that occurs online. Um, it's gonna be interesting. You know, um, it's a ragtag group of rebels right now, but uh, folks who are very, very, um, you know, skilled at what they're doing, um, who have great reputations in cryptography and privacy and security and so on, and you haven't even met half the folks involved yet. Um, the, the, the environment we're moving into, right, um, means that we can implement this kind of utopian technology just as easily as the dystopian technology is being implemented. Um, so for example, when everybody was forced home, um, you know, uh, last year and everybody had to work and stream, uh, suddenly we're using Zoom, right? Uh, suddenly people are on, you know, Teams and all these other things, right? Um, the leap was taken into technology that is not going to liberate you, um, into an environment um, that is trying to capture you in a way, um, that dystopian tech was suddenly easy to implement, right? People were willing to take a leap into something else. Well, if we can do that, we can take a leap into this too. Um, and I think that's also the attitude that we know we're going to have um, from the audience um, who will be signing up for Panquake. Um, these technologies uh, have been around, but we're pushing them forward. Um, and things are going to be so much better um, once you start seeing the, the tech as it's coming through. Um, 
I just want to also say um, there's a very uh, ethical and strong dedication to free and open source software in the project. Um, already, you know, I've seen some questions, you know, when sort of the teaser announcement uh, was coming through for Talk Liberation about whether the code is going to be on GitHub, um, whether folks are going to be able to uh, volunteer um, and, and extend and so on and so forth. Um, there's going to be a lot of interoperability. There's going to be a very strong community effort, and the code is going to be free and open source. Um, so yeah, uh, this is an incredible opportunity, and everybody should get on board. Basically, if you're um, in an environment like, let's say, um, traditional, what we now call social media, right? You're in a glorified website where you are putting up a profile, you're finding people to socialize with or add to your list of friends or followers. Um, potentially, you're trying to promote yourself. Um, you may come up with you know, some sort of business plan around this sort of thing. Um, your options are limited by the type of manipulation that the founders and um, uh, owners of those networks really, um, by the type of manipulation that they intend to do. You know, uh, tools that allow you to, for example, spread, um, you know, the word with activism and so on, uh, can be very, very hard to study. And if you're interested in surveillance, right, you want specific data points, you want to be able to follow someone as they're going through a certain path, you want to be able to try to get insights into whether, okay, maybe this person would maybe in some world buy Chanel or buy, you know, a Ford or buy, you know, whatever the product is, a, a my pillow. Um, and uh, when you're when you're doing that kind of analysis on users, you have to limit the options that people have. Um, so Panquake basically um, is an opportunity to fold in um, some features, which you know, as Susie mentioned, uh, with Thunderquake, which have sort of existed before, um, especially in the younger days of some of these networks as an extension and so on, um, to revive those, polish them off and make them a central part of the network, right? Where the owners and operators of Panquake, because they're not surveilling people, will actively push for these kinds of features um, in the hopes that, uh, you know, the social dilemma, the corralling of users um, is lessened, um, that people's voices can really be heard, that organizers and active activists can get the word out when they need to, that content creators can, you know, um, monetize their content in a way that's ethical and where they can really reach people. Um, so, so those kinds of features are on the table when you're not ultra spying on users. Um, right now, you know, maybe in some world you could daisy chain a bunch of different solutions and, you know, who knows what the cost would be or what the situation would be. But when you start looking at that, you have to say to yourself, why do we not have these things now? Why are these things not in our networks? Um, in the same way, again, to bring it back to projects um, like the early days of Wikipedia, like the early days of Reddit with Aaron Schwartz, um, you know, those projects were trying to reach a goal of access to knowledge, to, you know, having real conversations. Um, and because of that, um, it, they were innovative in a very real way. There was a lot of information flowing through them um, with very little um, intermediaries blocking content. Um, and a project like Panquake is an opportunity to do that again. Uh, the transparency is huge. Um, so, you know, having the ability to store the information in a blockchain um, allows you to uh, make sure that from the outside, first off, the network can't be destroyed, right? Um, it, it means that um, folks can see what's actively going on in the blockchain, right? Um, but it also allows you to, if you're going to do some kind of moderation, if you're going to decide um, you know, that some new feature you're trying to ship um, should be on the front end software that's, that the user sees. Um, it allows you to um, have that cake <laughs> and eat it too, in a sense, um, where you can introduce new features without your users feeling like you're just kind of shifting the ground under their feet. 
Um, these other networks make such a big deal out of, you know, a theme changing or, you know, some toggle button being added to a menu and so on. And what's really going on behind the scenes is that, you know, there's dashboards and dashboards and huge amounts of staff that are watching the users, that are surveilling the users, that are actively, in, uh, you know, being paid for that service instead of working on the product, right? Instead of trying to do new cool things, instead of trying to listen to the feedback of users and meet it in any real way, so. All right, Sean, thank you so much for that analysis. I do want to bring on our next guest to speak about this product and why we do need an alternative to big tech right now. So I would like to introduce to all of the viewers right now, ex-NSA Technical Director, Bill Binney. Bill, welcome to the stream. Well, thank you, Taylor. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, especially to talk about uh, something that I see as a, a, a beacon of light for the future. Uh, simply because for over for, for more than 20 years, uh, I've been warning about the, uh, the drift of democracies towards totalitarian uh, practices and totalitarian state uh, operation of uh, spying. What they did fundamentally was uh, start, uh, instead of looking and studying people or groups of people who were potentially planning uh, criminal or, or other kinds of acts like militaries and so on, or governments or uh, drug smugglers, things of that nature, they shifted from that to looking at individuals. So that meant they were collecting everything on the, in, in, the, in the world on everybody they possibly could. Now, as a part of that process, they had to build large storage devices and they centrally stored all this data. And their entire objective was of course, population control. They, they may not have openly said that to you or may, may not have made that very clear to you, but that's been the tradition down through this, down through history of population control means you have to have knowledge about your population, everyone in it, what they're doing and what they're planning as best you can, so you can manipulate it and control it. And that's exactly what's been going on for, for more than 20 years. Uh, and this I started internally in the US government warning about in 2001. And then uh, after, they, after they attacked me because they didn't want anybody knowing about this, even internally in the government, they didn't want the government uh, representatives or senators, or they didn't want it well known that they were doing this. Uh, and so they attacked me with the Department of Justice and the FBI and they fabricated evidence and data against me because they have the data. What that means is they could actually manipulate it in terms of changing it modifying it to make it look like certain things are occurring. And they'll put that in sworn affidavits as they did with the Steele dossier and so on. They'll just lie openly to the court. And, and, the, and the problem is this has gotten so bad uh, in the 90s and, and in the two, that early 2000s, they started pulling in um, industry and tech industries and so on. Uh, and eventually they got them co-opted in and now they're just really one, one big community of data acquisition and data storage and data study on every individual in the, in the United States and around the world. So that, uh, I mean, it's like they, they are trying to be, if you are familiar with the, uh, the movie Minority Report, where they had a, uh, psych, psychics that were determining in advance what people were going to do. Well, this, this is really what their objective was. In order to do that, they had to store this data. This is one of the big things that uh, Panquake does not do. It doesn't store the data. So they don't, they don't have the data to abuse the data. In other words, abuse you as a part of that process. So, uh, and, and these big tech companies sell all the data they collect to the government for a profit. And so they're making money off of you. Uh, just for the, the work you do, you put the data in the base, you, you respond to things, you say you like this, you like that or whatever, and all that information is collected together and it characterizes you as a person as to what you think, how you feel, the things you like and the things you like to do. Uh, and that's, a, that's part of the, their, their process of uh, characterizing you and so on. And the other point is what that has done, uh, and you've seen it in this past uh, few years, with the Trump administration about how they are trying to manipulate and control the voting. And they do that simply by, by manipulating what is available for people to see. When you make a query, if they stack the query in such a way that the information that they don't want you to see is at the bottom, 
uh, and, and the data they want you to see, which conveys the uh, concept that they want everybody to believe, why then that shows up at the top. And, and they, the, unfortunately it returns, returns so many returns, you get so many options to look at, you never make it through to the, to the point where you can see the things you might have really wanted to see. And so what they're doing is stacking the deck on, on, on controlling the narrative so they control what you see and therefore what you begin to think about and the things that you feel uh, exist in the society and how, how you should deal with them. And so that's, uh, that's fundamentally the, the, the problem with the big techs. I mean, you can see it even now with the shadow blocking, they'll shadow block people who, who they don't want to, to, uh, to uh, have uh, uh, data seen or, or see their data. Or, or they will just simply bar them and, and throw them out of their, uh, uh, their, their product and so they can't uh, communicate using it. Like for example, uh, President Trump, he had 80 million follow, over 80 million followers on uh, Twitter and they threw him off Twitter. Well, I mean, that shows you the arrogance of these people. They're, they obviously are convinced that uh, they will be exempt from antitrust laws and, and prosecution under antitrust laws uh, want with the new administration coming in. So that's the reason they felt they could do these kinds of things and get away with it because they expect to be protected. And that's that incestuous relationship between government and these tech companies that, that is playing out. That's how it's turning out. They're, they're planning on controlling the narrative and, and making sure that people who have a state who, who cannot exercise the First Amendment right by that way because they simply bar them from being able to communicate. And when you do that, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's why the antitrust laws where it first came into being was to, to uh, stop monopolies from, from destroying any potential competition. That's what they did to Parler. When Parler, uh, well, when people started to migrate to Parler, they shut Parler down. They had to because otherwise they would lose control. And that's what they really wanted. And this is really one of the first opportunities I've seen of, of, a, uh, of a product coming along uh, uh, that, that will allow the power to be in the hands of the people, actually the users, and not in the and the people running the system, and they also uh, won't be storing the data, so they can't retroactively analyze what you've done or what the things you you have done over any period of time to try to help predict the kinds of things that you're doing. So, uh, and they have no uh, they have no uh, everything they they're talking about is going to be visible to you, so you know the the rules under which you operate. It won't be. It won't be that uh, you know we'll we'll uh, block you because uh, because what you're saying might lead to some type of violence or or because of what you didn't. You may not have actually said that, but they'll interpret it that way. So they have these secret interpretations, you know, that they will make based on the regulations that they have to operate, which you don't really know anyway. So it's basically saying that if we don't like you, we're going to shut you down. You're not going to be able to talk, talk to anybody using our platform. So that's the kind of thing that I see here that this kind of product gets around. It says, we aren't going to do that. Everything's going to be visible, out the open, so you can see what you're doing and, and how, we're, how we manage and operate. And if you have any problems, you can, you can address it. So, uh, but again, it's, it's, the, it's the point that they are not taking control and not making arbitrary decisions. They're, they're doing things in a open, uh, exposed way so that things are visible to people and they know the ground rules of operating. And that, that to me was a big, big thing, especially when it came to the, uh, to the big techs who are like uh, Twitter and so on, who have fundamental monopolies around the world on these kinds of, uh, of communications memes. Uh, and so I, I just see this as, a, as, a, uh, as one of the best ways that we the people can start to turn the ship of state around from being a totalitarian state, which I call the United Banana Republic states, because now we are banana republic. Uh, and unless we can turn this around and have a way to keep getting uh, an informed public and informed electorate that where people know what's going on and they have the opportunity to see all points of view and all, all, uh, all aspects of, of issues, uh, and, and, and then make up their own minds, uh, then, you know, then we have a truly uh, a republic, as, in, as Ben Franklin said, we'll have a republic if we can keep it. And that's really the issue now, is can we keep it? And with the current setup, the way, the op way these tech companies are operating, 
They believe that they know better and that we have no, uh, whatever we think doesn't matter. And so they'll, they'll filter us out, they'll chop us off, they'll stop us from communicating so we can't share our thoughts or our ideas or opinions or anything. So, and that's a total violation. They're scrapping as a constitution. That doesn't matter anymore. I mean, when, when all the crimes that are visible from Washington, D.C. on television, you can see these people committing these crimes and saying, you know, well, we'll let them get away with it because they're part of the us. And so I, I kept referring to the, the department of uh, the DOJ as I called it the department of just us. In other words, we, the people of the United States are not part of it. So we don't have the, we don't have the set of rules or laws that they have. They have a special set which they never get prosecuted. I mean, if you notice, no one has been prosecuted for all the, all the crimes they're committing, like lying to the FISA court or lying to all of that. And that, that never happens. And so, and what happens to the telecommunications company for all the constitutional violations of the rights of US citizens? They get retroactive immunity from the Congress. Why? Because they've committed so many crimes that if they were ever prosecuted, they'd be out of business. So they had to be protected. And that's essentially what's going to be happening here. These people feel, these tech companies feel that they are so powerful now with the new regime coming in in Washington that, that they, won't, they will be exempt from any laws. All the antitrust laws won't be used against them and, and uh, we can just watch and see. It's not going to happen. Nobody's gonna get prosecuted. Why? Because it's the Department of Justice. They're included, we are not. And so uh, to me, I see this, this, uh, this program as one of the beacons of light to allow us to help break this, this uh, tending, this sliding slowly into totalitarian state, not just in the United States, but around the world. I mean, this is spreading all around the world. And we all, and the only way to stop it is to start having an informed, a, 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 an informed public that can make decisions based on truth and facts. And, and the only way to get that is to have a free exchange of ideas and follow the First Amendment with free speech. Phil Benny, thank you. I do want to encourage everybody right now who is watching to please visit panquake.com. You can donate to this project as well as get signed up and also spread the word about this movement and about Panquake using the hashtag Talk Liberation. Our next guest is a comedian and the host of the Political Vigilante on YouTube. Graham Elwood is now joining us. Graham, thank you for Hello. coming Hello. I'm having a video issue. For some reason, it's not working. I don't know. All right, we'll do, we'll do this weird angle like this. Oh, I, I love Zoom. I love tech issues. Um, I don't know if this is a weird time to bring this up, but I'm actually in favor of censorship. So I don't know if I'm on the right panel here. Um, I'm not, uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, I like, I think it's, I think it's totally cool that unelected tech billionaires uh, that work hand in glove with the CIA, you know, can tell us what we can and cannot say and do on social media. I don't know. I don't know what the big deal is. And the ads, I mean, like I'm wearing Chanel perfume right now. I never knew that I needed to express myself, you know, sexually with Chanel. So, I mean, I don't know what that, and also too, I think a lot of great stuff has happened. I mean, like I was going to vote for Hillary Clinton in 2016 and then a red, white, and blue Donald Trump dildo showed up on my Facebook feed and that made me vote for Jill Stein. And so I'm kind of glad that happened. So I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm on the, I shouldn't have been on this panel. Uh, no, I'm, I really appreciate Susie calling um, and, and telling me about this a while ago. And I, I just think that it was, um, this is a great idea. And the time has come like me and, and somebody just like Lee Camp and Jimmy Dore who are, um, who are coming up after this. And uh um, you know, tip your weight staff. I, you know, we've all been talking about this. I think everyone, this has been on the tip of everyone's tongue for a while. And, you know, just the way these tech companies censor just me. And I'm sure, I'm sure Lee and Jimmy can attest to this. And anyone can attest to this. I've been stuck at 74,200 YouTube subscribers for a while. In fact, they were unsubscribing people to where I was losing viewers. And I mean, I've had my live streams cut out anytime I talk about you know, something they don't want me to talk about. Uh, and I've switched over to a platform, you know, for streaming that uses blockchain open source. And I, I, I the more I learn about that, uh, I think that's, this is the absolute way to go. And 
you know, there's no, there's no reasonable discourse now. And after watching, you know, what happened at the Capitol building, uh, you know, where the neo-Nazis had a furry convention in this nation's capital, I um, was like, oh man, while that was an awful event, they're going to really use that as an excuse for Patriot Act 2.0 and just censor anybody they don't like. Anyone that's going to be critical of Biden, they're going to go after. And so this is just, I think the time is common and you know, I've had viewers of mine say, well, Graham, you guys got to, and I'm like, well, I'm not a tech, I'm not a tech person. <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I know how to, to, uh, you know, make vegan smoothies, surf and, and tell dick jokes. I'm good at those things, but I don't have the brain capacity of the, of the people, uh, in terms of technology that are putting this together. And the more I've heard Susie, not just today, but we've had conversations explain what this is. It's really exciting. I mean, I really feel like this is something I definitely am excited to be a part of. And I, once it gets up and running, uh, I'm sure people might be critical of it or whatever, but I think people will really notice that things aren't getting thwarted and all those things that, that Susie was talking about in that presentation at the beginning of like, that th all those things, we all have stories, versions of those stories that have happened to us. Like, oh, I lost this thing. Why does this person getting more, more views and more this whatever? And how come this media outlet is keeps gaining followers when I'm losing them or whatever. So I, I just, it's, it's an exciting thing to be a part of uh, at the ground level. And, and literally, you know, when I started doing stand-up comedy, I didn't ever think I was going to be on a panel following an NSA whistleblower. <laughs> I'll be real, I'll be real honest with you. When I was hosting game shows on basic cable, I really did not think I was going to follow Bill Binney, who is a, uh, an awesome person and a, and a, and a, and a genius. Um, but I don't think he can talk at a game show host voice. And that's why I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, to do panquake. Um, no, I, I if, if you need me to do any panquake advertising, Susie, please hit me up. No, I'm, um, I'm excited very excited to be a part of this. And uh, I will push this out to my audience as hard as I possibly can. And they, my audience wants stuff like this. And I pushed, I've pushed them over to this other platform, uh, this Rockman one from after they see what happens to YouTube. So I think the, the people out there know they're being lied to. They know they're being manipulated to. They just can't quite put their finger on it. And um, having Susie with a technical background and a uh, activist background putting these two things together it's it's and then having people like like bill and sean and uh who know, like how bill knows how the deep state works um that's the coolest thing to be a part of so i just i'm just glad i was asked to do this and glad to be here and uh i um you know uh black lives matter fuck the police i yield my time no that's it i'm done thank you so much All right, thank you. Again, do make sure that you guys visit panquake.com to get signed up, to donate, and to also spread the word about this movement. Next up, we are joined by a comedian, Jimmy Dore. Jimmy, welcome to the stream. Hi, well, I hope everybody can hear me. Everything good? Everything's working correctly? Yes. All right, fantastic. So, uh, you know, we're living in an era of tech monopolies. And we don't have anybody enforcing antitrust laws. And so we all know that the way people communicate now in society is through social media apps. Basically, Facebook and Twitter would be the two biggest ones. And uh, those are being controlled by Silicon Valley billionaires that are in bed with politically and economically with the Democratic Party and the establishment media. And you know, people make the point that these social media companies never wanted to have to do this. They never they never wanted to have to be the ones that were going to be um, censoring people. Where did this come from? This came from the establishment and the Democratic Party's lack of ability to cope with the fact that Donald Trump got elected. So Donald Trump got elected and everybody was like, well, it, it couldn't possibly be neoliberalism and austerity. It couldn't possibly be the way we've we've ordered our society and the way we're going to do our economies. It couldn't be endless war, neoliberalism and austerity. That couldn't be why people were so desperate that they voted for Donald Trump. No, it had to be Russia. And so the corporate news journalists, the lefty 
quote unquote lefty, quote, a n- corporate news journalist uh, started demanding that uh, social media companies start censoring. And the Democratic Party started demanding that, too. And members of the establishment started demanding censorship. And why is that? Why would they want to demand censorship after Donald Trump's phenomena? After, well, because they lost control of the narrative uh, and they can't sell neoliberalism anymore. So that's what happens when you try to sell neoliberalism for 50 years. You get Donald Trump eventually. And so now they can't. They can't sell neoliberalism anymore. It can't be done. And so now what they're going to try and do is control the narrative. And that's happening through censorship. And so and they're going to do it. They, they have a pro censor guy in the White House. They have a, a pro censor politician. The leftiest of lefty politicians in the Democratic Party are super pro censorship. So the people, the squad are advocating for fascism right now. So they're, they're they want you to be afraid of fascism and their antidote to it is fascism. That's what censorship is. That's what you give the control of the narrative to the establishment. And has censorship ever helped anybody except the establishment, surveillance state, intelligence community and the corporation? No, that's that's the only people that has ever helped. So that's why this is super important that we do this. And if this can if this could really work, it could be a game changer. So I'm not smart enough to know how any of this stuff works. Blockchain. Or my, you know, rock, whatever. I don't know about that stuff. You guys do. And if Bill Binney's involved, you know that it's going to be secure. The guy uh, is the smartest guy, code breaker guy in the world. So uh, any outsmarted the FBI. So that's we need a guy like that around somebody who's can outsmart the FBI on the regular and is the world's greatest code breaker. So he's a part of this. That's why this is important. Uh, well, that's why this this will probably succeed. Um, uh, it's important because it's necessary for all the reasons I just uh, laid out. You know, they use the war on terror to get rid of our privacy. They use the one I'm mean, talking about in the United States. They use the war on terror to ramp up their surveillance state. And we now live in a uh, unconstitutional surveillance state, why, oh, an Orwellian hellscape. That's what we live in right now. Um, they're throttling. Anybody who tells the truth about the war gets immediately called a conspiracy theorist and sanctioned, right? And they can immediately try to throttle their, their whatever it is. So they just, I just got 4,000 people unsubscribed from my Twitter over over the Capitol riot. I don't know why they, what the hell I had to do with that, but that's what happened. Uh, they've been throttling the hell out of our YouTube. So the, the million, do- million subscriber mark is a big deal for a lot of people psychologically. And so they're trying to keep independent media from getting there unless you're on the corporate algorithm. So there's lots of people on the corporate algorithm who pre- pretend to be independent media they're not people like the young turks or people who are on comcast platforms who are also on youtube those are not independent media those are corporate funded and they're on a corporate algorithm which is why they're allowed to get five million subscribers but nobody watches their show right so i don't even have a million subscribers on youtube but i get 20 30 000 live streamers at a time and those people with five million subscribers don't even crack ten thousand. so that that's how the corporation is like uh, uh, uses the algorithm to push to push corporate news and suppress independent news and ideas. And it's more important now than ever, because, for instance, on YouTube, you're not allowed to talk about coronavirus in an unapproved way. It has to be pre-approved and you can only use pre-approved sources, which is kind of like the death of actual debates. So if I'm only allowed to use uh, sources that you pre-approve have the right information, what about when they're wrong? Isn't that the whole point of debate and free speech? And so we just got went through where Dr. Fauci lied uh, and admittedly lied about the efficacy of, of using masks. He lied about that for a few months. Then he lied for like five months, six months straight about herd immunity and what how many people would need to be that. Va- he admitted he I'm not accusing him. He said self-admitted that he lied about these things. No one cares. No one cares. They only care if Donald Trump lies because they only want to squash Donald Trump. They're, they they like lying. They like Joe Biden. He's a pathological liar. So they just they just want again. This is all about controlling the narrative. And so that's why this is more important than ever uh, that we get something like this done uh, again. They're they're using the last few days of Trump fear to try to cement 
new censorship. And if you're not for censorship, you're for fascist. I've heard even lefty news show hosts say that, that if when you stand up for free speech, you're defending fascists. Uh, those people, sh <clears throat> those should people should be exposed to people who think like that. That's not a left wing. That's not lefty. That's authoritarian. That's not progressive. That's not lefty. That's not uh, in the spirit of free speech. That's nothing. That's authoritarian claptrap. And anybody caught uh, telling someone who's standing up for a principle, which is what we all are standing up for, the principle of free speech. And when someone smears you and says you're you're standing up for fascists, that person needs to be outed. Um, so I, I don't mean to get off track here, but we need a new social media because we're this is it. It's all over. They did it. They used Trump to, to this fear of Trump and the fear of fascism to implement fascism. So that's why this is super. We super need this. Um, there's going to be more neoliberalism. There's going to be austerity. There's going to be more censorship. There's going to be more author authoritarianism. And the United States is going to slide into being Brazil, which we probably already are. There's people sleeping under every there's an unbelievable rift between rich and poor. Anybody who has a job is living paycheck to paycheck. And that's why they need to censor. And that's why this is more important than ever. We need to have open, free discussion, not for for especially uh, in this time and, and for thought leaders, because that's what they go after. They throttle thought leaders. They shadow ban them. Anybody who's got an idea, they're going to squash. Or they're going to censor in one way or another. So that's why this is super important. I just thank everybody who's involved in this, who's getting it done. I'll help. I'll try to help publicize it. Anything I can do. And uh, just it's uh, just fantastic to see Bill Benny's face and him a part of this. So let's fight the man. Free speech. All right, Jimmy Dore, thank you. We really do have an excellent team of people who are working on this product. Make sure that you guys do stick with us because at the end, we will be joined by many of the team members on this project. So make sure that you do stick with us. But for right now, we are joined by our next guest, Lee Camp. Lee is a comedian and the host of Redacted Tonight on RT America. Lee, thanks for joining us. Hello. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me. For those who I haven't met yet, thanks for viewing this. I'm Lee Camp, full-time raconteur, part-time provocateur, and wannabe saboteur. First of all, thank you, uh, Susie and everyone, for working so hard on this project. It's uh, honestly, it's been a lifelong dream of mine to be involved in something, anything called Project X, and now it's it's finally happened. I'll, I'll be honest, in most of my fantasies, Project X involved building some sort of superhero out of robot parts and Andre the Giant's reanimated corpse. But a new social media platform will 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 have to do for now. But you know, if you, I mean, if you find a way to use the part of Andre the Giant, I'm I won't complain. But much has been made in the past few uh, past few weeks, past few years, past few months of how powerful social media platforms have gotten and how they are capable of creating movements and crushing them. And therefore, the people running and owning these platforms are incredibly powerful. We all know that. If you say anything that doesn't fit inside the allowable corporate endorsed talking points, as Jimmy was just talking about, then you are going to be suppressed and silenced. Because I am anti-war, because I am pro-peace, because I am anti-corporate and anti-exploitation, because I stand for equality and justice and environmental protection, that makes me a target for suppression. I have, I have watched my pages, I've watched my pages and channels have gone from vibrant, popular spaces to a comparable ghost town, receiving one-tenth of the viewers and readers I used to have. My YouTube page is almost never recommended to new viewers. Because why would corporate America recommend something that criticizes corporate America? My Facebook went from gaining 5,000 followers a week to never gaining any. Literally, my Facebook was at 335,000 followers in 2016. And since that time, it has only gone down because some sort of shadow ban was instituted against me at that time. Readers tell me that when they, that, that they follow my page and then they'll check back a few weeks later, and they've been unfollowed without their knowledge. 
Now, since all of the main platforms, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Google, et cetera, are essentially owned by corporate America, that means at the end of the day, they are meant to benefit and serve corporate America. And it doesn't take much thought to realize that corporate America stands for profit over people, exploitation over exploration, dollars over development of the possibilities of humanity, wars for wealth, over the welfare of average people. Those are their goals at the end of the day. They always will be. And therefore the social media platforms owned by corporate America will always further those aims. And that's why I, I wanna speak about one of the aspects of Panquake that I think sounds great and probably is not the most highlighted feature. Uh, all the censorship and everything has been he heavily discussed as it should be. I think that's probably the most important thing. Uh, but I wanna talk about one of, the, one of the other features, no advertising. No advertising. Are you fucking kidding me? That's incredible. People don't seem to realize, re realize and really understand how dangerous, how insidious and pernicious advertising is. The estimates are that the average person takes in between 1,000 and 3,000 ads and brand names per day. Per day per day, just like it's hosing you down, just corporate mouthpieces spraying you in the face. And each one of those one to 3,000, each one of those is designed to influence you and manipulate you. We all think that we're like just smart enough to avoid being manipulated by ads and commercials. But, and here's the thing, we're not. We're not smart enough. We're fucking animals at heart, okay? No matter how bright you think you are, no matter how opinionated and self-confident you are, those things still impact you. If they didn't, then companies wouldn't spend billions of dollars on them. It's that simple. That proves they work. And if they didn't spend those, if, 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 the, if those commercials and ads and brand names and everything else didn't work, then, you know, why do I have uh, five Snuggies and a crate full of penis pills? Because they work. The ads, not the pills. And almost all commercials and ads are selling one thing, really, when you shrink it all down, you boil it all down, they're selling one thing, need. They sell you need and want. They use every emotional tactic in the book, jealousy, insecurity, fear, desire, loss. They use it all, but at the end of the day, they are all creating a void in your psyche that they hope you'll try to fill with their product. And in that way, they are endlessly and tirelessly pushing consumerism, pushing materialism, pushing a way of life that is completely unsustainable and impossible in the long term. They are selling us our own death spiral. And any platform or application or outlet that is funded by advertising will eventually bend towards the wants and needs of large corporations. It may not happen immediately, but those massive, powerful corporations, through their ad dollars, exert a sometimes obvious, but sometimes subtle pull, a gravity that never lets go, a gravity that is always there, that pulls everything towards consumerism, towards capitalism, towards corporatocracy. If we so choose, we can each run against the gravity for a time. You can fight it for a time, but it's exhausting. It slowly tires you out and sucks out your life force like a parasite. Eventually, even those running against the tide will give in or give up and corporate needs will win out. The advertisers get their way, unfettered capitalism triumphs. So that's why I think the no advertising policy of Panquake is so important and so revolutionary. I can't speak to everything that makes this idea great. I mean, hell, I've, I've only been, I was only told about it a few months ago, but I know how dangerous and all consuming corporate interests can be. And as long as you're on an advertiser funded platform, you will never be getting the full truth. There are also a hundred other reasons this, uh, this new project is important and desperately needed. And I, I, as everyone has been doing, and as they will continue to do throughout uh, this, this presentation, they will be telling you about those. Uh, but I thought I would focus on one of the features that is probably a little less talked about, 
because uh, the, the, the dealing with censorship and suppression is at the top of the list, but uh, not being funded by corporate America and corporations around the world uh, that are incredibly powerful. I mean, they basically own our government at this point. That is a huge factor in this and incredibly important. And that's why it sounds exciting to me. All right, thanks a lot and keep fighting. All right, Lee Camp, thank you. Again, to get involved in this project and to sign up, please visit panquake.com and also do donate. That way you can sign up and spread the word about this project and about this movement using the hashtag talk liberation. All right, for our next speaker, this is a pre-recorded video. I had a chance to speak with Chris Hedges. He is an investigative journalist and a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, in fact. And I had the opportunity to speak with him about censorship, privacy, and about Panquake specifically. So we are going to play that video for you right now. Big tech, uh, especially during the last electoral campaign, uh, showed how willing it is to censor on behalf of the Democratic Party hierarchy. Uh, they, for instance, locked the New York Post out of its own Twitter account uh, to block the revelations that the New York Post published that were found on Hunter Biden's discarded laptop. Um, they have long used algorithms, I'm a victim of it, uh, to direct people away from left-wing critics. Uh, and of course, they were a major funder of the Biden campaign. They pumped uh, you know, probably hundreds of millions of dollars in the last few weeks of the campaign in the negative campaign ads. And then uh, since the assault on the Congress, uh, they have uh, wiped out the, all of the social media platforms of President Trump. Uh, they uh, have um, closed down Parler, uh, a rival uh, digital platform. Uh, and we have even the supposed left wing of the Democratic Party, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others calling for censorship. Now, these are utterly opaque uh, for-profit corporations that are bonded to the security and surveillance state. Amazon has a $600 billion contract with the CIA. Uh, and I think that with the rise of the Biden administration, there's a particular animus towards the left because the left, groups like WikiLeaks or uh, independent journalists like Glenn Greenwald or Matt Taibbi call the Democrats out for who they are. So I expect the censorship to be accelerated under the Biden. I, I, not, I think we're already seeing an acceleration of that censorship. Uh, very foolish on the part of the liberal class to call for it uh, because these are unaccountable, uh, you know, very uh, dark and malevolent forces. That's why even the ACLU and many leaders in Europe uh, denounced the uh, wiping out of the uh, social media accounts of Trump uh, because they know where that's headed. So uh, it's imperative that those of us who care about the free flow of information uh, begin to try and build alternative systems uh, before we're in this kind of Orwellian dystopia. Uh, they, they, these Google, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, they already control the communications by, by billions of people. Uh, and uh, as the social unrest, which is going to grow within the United States, uh, is exacerbated, then these uh, media platforms, digital platforms are going to become ever more draconian in terms of blocking out content. Well, it's free of corporate control. I mean, that's the fundamental uh, asset that it has, uh, that it it uh, is not <clears throat> bound to the security surveillance state or to Silicon Valley, uh, but will offer, in many ways, Parler did uh, before it got shut down. Um, Substack does, for instance, for independent journalists like Matt Taibbi and uh, Glenn Greenwald, but I worry that they will come, that they, uh, you know, it's not just that they control so much of the flow of information, but they're so aggressive in going after alternative sites uh, that, uh, uh, you know, essentially want to protect free speech. Well, everybody already feels the effect of censorship. So, for instance, since this anonymous site, Prop or Not, Propaganda or Not, was posted 
uh, accusing left-wing sites, uh, most of which I either write for or run my stuff of being agents of a foreign power, algorithms have been used to steer people away from my content and the content on those sites, Black Agenda Report, Counterpunch, Truth Dig Before It Closed Down, etc. Uh, so they're already feeling the effects of it. Uh, and, and that's not conjecture. So my last year at Truth Dig, uh, they did a graph uh, uh, documenting impressions. Impressions are, if you go into Google and typed in the word imperialism, and I had written something on imperialism recently, it would come up with anything else. Uh, and the referrals from impressions dropped from over 700,000 to below 200,000, and I'm sure they're much lower now. The same thing for WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. So people are, are already affected by this control, uh, and uh, what they're doing is steering uh, readers and viewers towards corporate-dominated, corporate-controlled media outlets like MSNBC or CNN or the New York Times. So there's a collusion between these established media outlets and the censorship of Silicon Valley, of these digital uh, media platforms, uh, because it benefits them. Uh, and, uh, and they work, uh, outlets such as MSNBC, the New York Times, NPR, they, they are, and have devolved into propaganda arms for the Democratic Party. Uh, and we've just seen that. I mean, the New York Times calling the John Podesta emails, which were published by WikiLeaks, misinformation. That's just factually incorrect. The Podesta emails are true. Nobody has ever challenged the veracity. The same thing with the contents on Hunter Biden's laptop. Nobody in the Biden campaign or the Biden family uh, denounced that as fake news or misinformation. Uh, instead, they attacked it as kind of Russian propaganda. Uh, it, 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 but they didn't. They did. They never challenged the actual uh, content itself, which was also true for the Bedesta emails. Uh, and uh, and so there's a collusion between established corporate media and Silicon Valley uh, to wipe out those centers of information uh, that challenge the dominant narrative. Uh, and there's of course a, you know a, a profit plays a huge part in this. Uh, but we know from the uh, Pew uh, Research Center, which did a poll last summer, uh, who uh, outlets like the New York Times now serve. I think it's uh, 91% of the readers of the New York Times uh, self-identify as Democrats, 87% of those who listen to NPR, 94% of those who watch MSNBC. And of course, then you have the inverse, where about 94, 95% of those who watch Fox News, Fox News identify as Republicans. Well, this is very dangerous because Essentially, you're pitting demographic against demographic, uh, widening the kind of social and political divides uh, in, in the midst of, you know, extreme stress uh, uh, within the economy and uh, deep suffering. And that, uh, that divide at a certain point, it may already be there, becomes so unbridgeable, people can't communicate. So you need uh, nonpartisan uh, uh, outlets where people can go to get information that isn't essentially working on behalf of uh, one faction or another. It's crucial, uh, especially as we watch big tech become more and more aggressive, as they have in the last couple of weeks, in terms of shutting down uh, any kind of uh, digital platforms that is a threat to the hegemony of the Democratic Party and, and, uh, and, the, and the ruling power elite within the Democratic Party. I'll, I'll use it for all the reasons I just stated. I know many of the people behind it, including Bill Binney, and I trust their integrity uh, and I, I trust their word. We have to begin to build alternatives and use them uh, to free ourselves from the death grip uh, that uh, corporations like uh, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and everyone else has uh, on our ability to communicate and inform ourselves uh, about what's happening in the world. What we are doing here is really groundbreaking and innovative. So make sure that you do join us and visit panquake.com. Please donate, get signed up, and make sure you spread the word using the hashtag Talk Liberation. Our next speaker of the evening is Peter Lavelle. Peter is the host of RT's Crosstalk and also the co-host of The Gaggle on YouTube. I spoke with him earlier this week about Panquake, about censorship, 
and also about privacy issues. And he is endorsing this product. And this is what he had to say. Why did uh, Julian Assange establish WikiLeaks? Because journalism it had uh, no longer uh, function to inform society. So we need another platform, a platform where people can speak more freely not, and not be so judged all the time. I, everyone knows I, I, I'm a conservative, but I learn from people that I um, uh, don't always agree with. And through discussion, through debate, I learn more and I become a better person. And I think my interlocutors do also. And we need a platform of good faith. Because I think we're missing that in our public discourse, okay? Because what has happened now with the, these, these huge platforms out there, they've created a dystopian environment. And, you know, being a conservative, what comes first? Well, obviously your family, but community. And community in, in our age right now is online. And so I want to be able to talk to people in good faith and smart people, because I really would like to cut out all of the nonsense, because I don't like wasting time. I want to engage people in an intelligent way that I know are good faith actors. So we need a platform desperately. And, and I've seen the number of speakers that you have at this event. Most of them come from the left, and I admire them all. I don't always agree with their politics, but these are people I want to have contact with because I can learn from them without all always hyperventilating all of the time. We need cooler um, minds. We need people uh, to be more understanding. And so, you know, Penquake sounds to me that that fits the bill, uh, fits the bill perfectly. And, and I want to get this word out as much as possible. First of all, I think they're a lot more, they're more interested in having um, uh, public discourse uh, and openness uh, to public discourse where um, it, it's not so partisan. We have to take sides all the time. Obviously we can disagree, but if we have a technology where we all moderate ourselves, for example, I can see what other people are doing. And I think that that would actually moderate people more because you're, you know, you, everyone wants to have standing in, in their community. Well, this is a community where I think that people will have a lot more respect and with these kind of technologies here is far more transparent. We've lost all of the transparency in these high, big tech companies. They promised us this. There would be uh, 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 an equal playing field. There would be transparency. Well, no, that, that, that's not, it didn't come to fruition. It didn't happen. And we need a technology where people feel comfortable, comfortable where their privacy is protected, but at the same time, uh, they have this ability to go into the public sphere and talk about ideas that are important to them and talk about the condition of society. With these platforms that exist right now, all they do is divide people, okay? And, 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 and what it does is it creates a lot of social instability. We need a platform where people can feel that um, there's a veracity to the arguments that are being made. My selling point would be is that, look what the other guys are doing. You, want, you like being there? I very rarely go on Twitter because first of all, it's a waste of my time. And all you do is you have all of these, you know, it's, 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 it, it's policed by some of the, mo the worst elements, okay? Uh, that, that want to break up uh, a public discourse. And if, if you have a, a certain view, which I, I think could be uh, uh, held by, uh, I know held by millions of people, and then you're just simply attacked, okay? And, and, and I, I think we're all tired of that. So much of our time and our energy is, is, is uh, consumed by that kind of thing. I'm not interested in spectacle. I'm interested in, t in learning uh, uh, ideas from other people. And I will tell everyone I know and, and, and tell them, you know, this is the place where, you, where we can be. Uh, I, 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 I've looked at the list of people that are involved in it. I've looked at their credentials. I, 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 I'm aware of other people that are promoting it. You know, I, I don't need a whole lot more convincing, to be honest with you. For me, the most important thing is that um, the lack of censorship. But if there's going to be a control of the discourse, it's going to be your peers on the platform that are going to inform you, correct you if you're wrong, provide additional information. That's the kind of thing we need right now. Instead of people, um, you know, instead of living in an atmosphere where it's just one conspiracy after another, one crisis after another, I think that it's going to be much more important for people on the platform on Panquake to be able to say, hey, you know, that's not the direction things are going in here. This has been 
being misrepresented. Um, and you might want to look into that. I mean, the, I'll tell you, the Panquake for me is going to be kind of like how I conduct myself online. I'm not particularly enamored by websites. I'm enamored by people and I follow people. I don't follow sites necessarily. Um, and, and, and then some of the sites that I do like, I still pick and choose what I want, what I want to read. Why do I read them? Because I trust them. Okay. I, if they're left, right, center, independent, I know where they're coming from and it's far more genuine. And that's what I would like to see Panquake be, become. Okay. It, not only a, a community where you can interact with people, but be a, uh, uh, valuable and reliable information source. Because I don't like, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, Twitter. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, like, for example, on, on Facebook, I'm, I'm just tired of all of the junk that is thrown at me all of the time. And, and it, it's, it's for me, you know, I have 25,000 messages on, on Facebook that I have never answered, okay? I wanna answer uh, uh, messages from people I know, okay? And that's why on Panquake, I will have a very different approach to it because I will curate it, okay? These other ones, it's just so much white noise going all the time. And then, you know, the the the, the number of times on Twitter um, that I'm references made to me and I'm just slandered, you know? And it's like, you, you don't even wanna come and talk to me you know, what you're saying about me, why don't you say it to me instead of saying it to your ecosphere where, you know, I, I had nothing to do with your with your claim against me because number one, it's not true. And why want to even dignify you with that kind of slander, okay? I'm, I'm tired of this very polluted public sphere, okay? I want a place to go where I feel comfortable and I feel confident and I will be very, very particular. And I think that this is something that people will embrace Panquake and say, this is a, a, a fresh start. It, it, get rid of all the noise, get rid of all, all of the garbage and all of the policing around you. Irrespective of how you feel about the, the platform uh, Parler, I mean, you know, it, it was the, 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 the other big tech companies, I guess we call Parler mid tech, but you know, the big tech guys, they colluded and destroyed this platform, or colluded. So that's their, their anti, uh, their, their, their monopolistic behavior, their gross uh, intolerance of free speech, which I am a purist when it comes to free speech here. Um, you know, say whatever you want, okay. Um, um, but I, I will defend your right to say it, okay? And so that's so very important. Big tech, they're not interested in the quality of the public sphere. They're interested in power and profits. That's what they're interested in. And they, and they don't care the chaos that they sow. And, and that is, it, Panquake, if you wanna be in a responsible place, come to this platform because the, the, the Twitters and the Facebooks and the Amazons, they've abused their power and their privilege, and they should those privileges must be denied. But in the meantime, we have to start with a clean slate. Panquake really does redefine social media and puts the power back in the hands of the users. Now, shortly, you will get to meet some of our team members, but before that, I do want to provide you guys with a very special message that we have from Christine Assange, the mother of Julian Assange. Free speech is the foundation pillar of freedom as it allows us to defend all other freedoms. This is why the American founding fathers created the First Amendment. History repeatedly shows us that the first act of an emerging authoritarian regime, left or right, is to clamp down on free speech. So to defend our freedom, we must defend the right to free speech, including for those we disagree with. Recently, the powerful tech giants of Silicon Valley decided who would have free speech rights on the internet. During their cull, my own Twitter account lost 10,000 followers. It existed only to inform and update the public on the facts of the political persecution of my son, journalist Julian Assange. Julian had predicted that citizens' voices on the internet would be censored. In the lead up to this attack on free speech, a skilled and dedicated team of free speech advocates worked to set up a new internet free speech platform where all voices could be heard. I wish them well and encourage people to look at what they have to offer. Thank you. 
We are really excited to be launching this product, Panquake. If you want to get involved, please visit panquake.com.